This is the story of America's war with Vietnam and how it began. The history of Vietnam is one of conflict and great dynastic struggles, which have led to fragmentation of the country over the centuries, as well as inheriting the influence of many cultures. The idea that there's been one people called the Vietnamese throughout the last 2,000 years is a bit of a modern invention. After centuries of war in Vietnam, the one that began in 1955 would be internationally reported news and last for 20 years. America say that they're fighting an army of peasants. So how could they possibly lose? However, these people culturally know about war much better than any American has. A war that America deemed necessary in the fight against communism. These very intelligent men really thought that it was the beginning of the communist takeover of the world. There was a genuine, basic misinterpretation of what the threat to communism held for the United States and the rest of the free world. That's one of the really astounding things about the war, that such intelligent men could have been so wrong. The Tet Offensive, the fact that the Viet Cong had entered the American embassy in Saigon caused a great deal of damage. It did turn up American public opinion totally against the war. The protests were not even so much the soldiers as their mothers. Because what the hell is my boy doing in Vietnam? The devastation of this war continues to resonate today. Vietnam is the story of two major river deltas, the Red River Delta in the north and the Mekong Delta in the south. The three geographic areas of Vietnam were uh, first settled, as far as we know from the archaeology, by three different ethnic groups, uh, the Vietnamese in the north, the Cham people in that central coastal strip who belonged to various kingdoms known as Champa. And then the Mekong Delta were settled uh, earliest by Cambodians. The Cham people came actually from across the sea, probably from the north coast of Borneo. And uh, they were great uh, sailors and seafarers and traders. And they speak a language that's related to Malay. And they uh, developed their own uh, civilization in central Vietnam, largely influenced by Hinduism and to some extent Buddhism as well from India. They used to be the dominant kingdom, you know, the dominant political society on, on the South China Sea. For you know, five or six centuries, it was the sham that uh, controlled trade on, on the South China Sea. Trade then expanded from Europe to China, seeing the arrival of Western traders, as well as Muslim traders from India and the Middle East. Slowly, Champa became mostly converted to Islam, while Christianity became very important in the central and northern regions. Full-scale war broke out between the northern and the southern Vietnamese kingdoms. Part of their weaponry came from trading with the Westerners, so that the uh, Dutch would supply weapons to the Trin in the north, and their ships would uh, cross over the Portuguese ships supplying weapons from Macau near Hong Kong to the Nguyen family in the southern kingdom. Those are the first European contacts, but they were rapidly followed by the Dutch and then the British and the French. Before the Europeans arrived and throughout this period, there were flourishing local, quite sophisticated communities and societies often with cultures that had borrowed elements from religion to the way that kings ruled to political organization from India more than from China. Vietnam's interaction with Europe brought the arrival of Catholic missionaries, particularly the Portuguese. It was not until the arrival of French missionaries from the mid-17th century that their influence across Vietnam was really felt. The most significant of these missionaries was Alexander de Rhodes. He studied the Vietnamese language and compiled a dictionary into French. This opened up the language to foreign influence. The French converted an increasing number of Vietnamese from Confucianism to Roman Catholicism, 
the emperor became angry and ordered the execution of many missionaries. This was a turning point from friendly trading relations to aggressive behavior. The French almost seemed to use the execution of their missionaries as a reason to invade. They were without any territories, unlike the British in India, the Portuguese in the Philippines, the Dutch in Indonesia. They decided to take over Vietnam and establish a colony. There was this constant tension between different regions of Vietnam, and the French arrived in that context and indeed conquered Vietnam piecemeal. Around 1860, the French seized the area near Saigon. In the next two decades, they moved through central and northern Vietnam, with French troops expanding their control over all six provinces on the Mekong Delta and formed a colony known as Cochinchin. They divided the country into those three regions, uh, which it had never been divided into before. France assumed control over the whole of Vietnam. French Indochina was formed in October 1887. Cambodia and Laos were added in 1893. In the following years, the French influence would play a significant role in shaping Vietnam. Throughout its history, the country had been invaded by a stream of dynasties, and by the late 19th century, Vietnam had become vulnerable to French ambition. Years of civil war had led to a split between the North and the South. It was into this environment that resentment to French occupation gave a space for nationalism and then communism to rise. The influence of Russia and China alarmed the USA. South Vietnam is already under attack. But how did events lead to such a catastrophic loss of life? And how necessary was America's involvement in a war so far from home? By 1884, France had taken control over Vietnam, forming the territories of Tonkin, Annam, and Cochinchin. The French were keen to bring Vietnam under French law, and it wasn't long before French culture grew across the country. The French conquest was in fact supported by some Vietnamese, uh, including Catholics, but also some others who thought that the French could bring modernization to Vietnam. So there were some Vietnamese who sided with the French, and uh, including some who benefited economically. Uh, they were distributed lands in the south, particularly in the Mekong Delta. So uh, a new landlord class developed. As French influence expanded, they soon established the bureaucracy and architecture of their towns, building town halls, law courts, and schools. The education system evolved for the expatriates, but soon became a fashion for the wealthy local residents as well. In Hue, capital of the Annan section of Indochina, the Japanese, always so polite, do not disturb the semblance of ancient rule, likewise carefully preserved by the French colonial administration. In a modern home built for her by the French at Dalat, the Empress of Annan brings up her three attractive children in truly royal atmosphere. She accepts with oriental resignation the obvious facts of the situation. It was clear to parents that if they wanted their children to rise in the bureaucracy and get positions, uh, they needed to know the new, uh, newly adopted Latin alphabet. Uh, which came to be known as Quoc Nu, or the national script. And so the Vietnamese culture became internationalized in a way it hadn't been before. And uh, at the same time, a familiarity, a new familiarity with Western political ideologies, including communism. It was into this climate of French education that Ho Chi Minh was brought up the man who would change Vietnam's history forever. As a young man, he was keen to see the world and took employment on ships as a deckhand. He traveled to America, lived in London for a while, where he was rumored to have spent time as a cook, and also lived in Paris. Whilst in Paris, he petitioned for the independence and civil rights of the Vietnamese people from French rule. When this failed in the US under President Woodrow Wilson, 
Ho Chi Minh became disillusioned, which furthered his communist zeal. He spent time in Russia and China before being imprisoned by Chiang Kai-shek. His reputation at home was developing, and when he returned in 1941, he had almost a hero status. He was a, a very much a man of the world. He'd been educated in, uh, by the French. He'd travelled around the world as a, as a sailor, worked as a chef in, in, in London. In the Paris peace talks of 1919, he turned up at Versailles and demanded freedom from French colonialism for the Vietnamese people uh, and was thrown out. Ho Chi Minh uh, was a, a member of the French Socialist Party, which split in 1919, and he joined the communist faction which founded the, the uh, French Communist Party. During the Second World War, France had fallen to Nazi Germany in June 1940. The Vichy government in Paris immediately ceded control of Saigon and Hanoi to Japan. Japan enforced the right to land forces in Vietnam, they needed to block the transportation of war materials through Vietnam to the Allies. When Ho Chi Minh was released from prison in China, he returned to Vietnam to lead the Viet Minh independence movement. They fought against the Vichy French and Japanese forces. During World War II, Ho Chi Minh returned to China and with um, General Japan and, and others, uh, set up a communist resistance who fought the Japanese. In 1945, they taken over the north part of, of, of Vietnam. The, the south was liberated by, by the British, who, to justify taking back their own colonies in, in, the, in the Far East, rearmed the Japanese to hold the, the country until the French turned up to reoccupy South Vietnam. The Japanese and the French were very anti-communist and the Vietnamese Communist Party had been founded in 1930 by Ho Chi Minh. He uh, and the other Vietnamese communists rejected both the Japanese and the French, and they were the only uh, large political party in Vietnam which did oppose both the French and the Japanese. But at the end of the war, when both of those groups lost, uh, the communists led by Ho Chi Minh were in a stronger position to take over. I remember that uh, many people at that time talk a lot about Ho Chi Minh, who they call Uncle Ho. At that time, everyone thought he was somewhere, like up there, going down to help. But uh, obviously, he also a human being with some kind of ambition of his own. People respected Ho Chi Minh as a great patriot and were willing to support him. They were tired of being dominated by the French and now the Japanese and fought for their freedom. He oversaw many successful military actions against the French and then against Japanese occupation of Vietnam during World War II, supported secretly by the United States Office of Strategic Services. Ho Chi Minh had meanwhile formed a alliance with the United States and was rescuing French and American pilots who were shot down by the Japanese and delivering them to the American forces in the south of China. And so Ho Chi Minh was able to build an army with some support from the United States and was in a position to take over once the Japanese were defeated. Over the years, Ho Chi Minh had developed a significant army the country was in the midst of a huge famine. The Vietnam peasants blamed the French and Japanese who were keeping the rice to feed their troops, even exporting it to Japan. After the Japanese had handed Vietnam to the Viet Minh in 1945, an estimated two million Vietnamese people had died. One of the problems at the end of the Second World War is it led into a variety of other wars, particularly in Indochina. And the Vietnam War, which the United States inherited from the French, which they had lost, was in fact inherited from Ho Chi Minh himself when he had been an ally of the United States. And I think that the basic problem was Ho Chi Minh was a nationalist, first and foremost, not a communist. Since 1945, the American foreign policy was the containment of communism. There was the famous domino theory that if South Vietnam fell to the communists, so would Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, 
Uh, it, you know, it would spread down the Malay Peninsula until eventually Australia would become communist and one senator famously said, we don't want to start fighting when they land on Waikiki Beach. There's no question in my mind that these very intelligent men, McNamara and Rusk, really thought that it was the beginning of the communist takeover of the world. I mean, that famous domino theory, and they all believed it and it was dead wrong. The French finally built up to a point where uh, Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh in the North decided to resist and they started to attack the French in Hanoi in December of 1946. And the uh, war, which lasted until 1954, uh, began then. Meanwhile, the situation in French Indochina grows graver as bitter fighting sweeps through Hanoi, leaving misery and destruction in its wake. French troops move up country to engage the well-equipped forces of the Vietnam Republic, who made a desperate but unsuccessful bid to massacre the entire French population of the city. The French not let Vietnam independent, and that just pushed the country into the communist hand because everyone wanted to be independent and only communist was organized, well organized. The only intention, as far as I can tell, that Ho Chi Minh had about any other country was South Vietnam. President Eisenhower's refused to help the French with uh, airstrikes at the time of Bien Ben Phu. Ho Chi Minh was so able to, to, to marshal his forces, get Soviet aid in, and at the same time, keep the Chinese from getting frantic about it and getting help from them as well. And then that was his determination with an extraordinarily brilliant general. Over to the French fighting communism in Indochina as Ju-52 planes lend their weight in an all-out offensive against the red jungle strongholds of the Viet Minh forces. Particularly after the fall of China to the Mao's communist regime and the start of the Korean War in 1949 and 1950, respectively, uh, the United States began to give massive military uh, support and political support to the French effort in Indochina from 1950. The Americans were initially very reluctant to support them. But partly in exchange for support for France and NATO in Europe, the uh, Americans decided to support France in Indochina, uh, which led to American financial support and advisors and that sort of thing. The fight for Indochina goes on. French pilots flying American planes take up where the big guns left off, blasting communist divisions which had infiltrated French positions in the Hanoi Delta. For the next four years of that war, the United States paid for about 80% of the French military budget. And at the same time, the Chinese were supporting the uh, Vietnamese independence movement, led mostly by communists and fought mostly in the north. Many, many people from the south, like uh, everyone in Vietnam at that time, joined Viet Minh because their relationship, their involvement with resistant, they have uh, the heart for it. War comes to peaceful rice paddies, rich prize the Reds were hoping to seize, until the French, aided by the loyal Vietnamese, drove them into the sea. But from the backwaters of war come the helpless victims of aggression, the women, the children, the old and infirm. Communism passed their way. They have little left now but a spark of life that drives them on toward escape and sanctuary behind the French lines. It's clear that people on all sides were fighting for different reasons. The Americans were fighting to stop this tide of communism that would sweep down from China through Vietnam into the rest of Indochina, the rest of Southeast Asia. Um, the Vietnamese, some of them may have thought they were part of an international movement, but many of them were just fighting for their own personal uh, reasons, you know, to liberate the country against foreign occupiers or to get rid of the power of landlords and, and that kind of thing. The war that broke out in 1946 dragged on for eight years uh, and has its culmination at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu in, in 1954, where a very bold move by the French military goes completely wrong and they're outfought and outthought by the guerrillas under General Zapp. The first Indochina war came to an end with the Battle of Dien Bien Phu in 1954, culminating in a comprehensive defeat for the French. 
France agreed to withdraw its forces from all its colonies, and a conference at Geneva decided on the division of Vietnam, with control of the North given to the Viet Minh as the Democratic Republic of Vietnam under Ho Chi Minh, and the South becoming the state of Vietnam, nominally under Emperor Bao Dai. This prevented Ho Chi Minh from gaining control of the entire country. After the division of Vietnam into North and South, the North is seen as a communist threat by the United States. South Vietnam's Prime Minister Ngo Dim Diem faced a two-year deadline for a nationwide reunification vote. However, the US feared that Diem might not win. In the North, the Viet Minh had formed the National Liberation Front under Ho Chi Minh, known as the Viet Cong and started guerrilla warfare in the south of the country in an attempt to gain control. President Nguyen Diem came back to Vietnam with the acceptance from the last emperor, Bao Dai, in a referendum. He ousted Bao Dai, sent him into exile in France, and he became president. The, the, the South was still administered from Saigon until there was going to be an election which would then unite the country. When the Americans realized that they wouldn't win any election against the communists, they backed uh, Prime Minister Diem in South Vietnam to set up an independent state, state which, so it would be analogous to North and South Korea. Because of the influence of the Korean War upon American thinking, when the French lost at Dien Bien Phu, and Eisenhower had to decide what to do about the country. He decided to support the South Vietnamese government in, in, in place, and they supported that dreadful man, Diem. Diem was like a South American dictator about whom some American general, I think, once said, he's a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. And that strain of thought ran through the American government when they'd look at their allies around the world. And it was a mistake. Half of the villages were under communist rule in 1954. And uh, it wasn't clear who was going to come out on top. Uh, and indeed, the United States and uh, the other political groups also expected that the communists would win. It wasn't anything great American conspiracy to rule the world or anything. They just didn't want the Russians to take over when they realized that Soviet communism, as they saw it, was a menace, which it was. It would influence other parts of the world that they thought they could reach, and, uh, and as a consequence, Vietnam, after the French were defeated at Dien Bien Phu, was, was a prime candidate for American help. And so the CM regime immediately turned its attention to the religious, or the political religious sects uh, in the Mekong Delta and attacked them first. And so there was fighting in the streets of Saigon in uh, 1954 and 1955, and uh, much of it spread to the Mekong Delta. There was a sort of civil war in the early days of the South Vietnamese regime. The divisions and unrest in Vietnam continued. The rioting intensified, and the Vietnamese people continued to see Ho Chi Minh and the National Liberation Front as a way to gain back their independence. America continued to closely monitor the situation, uneasy at the rapid rise of communism in Vietnam, which they deemed to be a direct threat to them. This mood prompted President Kennedy to send in aid, ultimately ending in over half a million US troops and a bloody war that would last for 20 years. In the 20th century, Vietnam had endured invasion from France and China. It had seen the creation of Indochina under French rule and the development of French culture and influence in the coming years. After the defeat of the French at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, the Geneva Peace Conference divided the country, with control of the South, now led by Diem, supported by America. North Vietnam was given to the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, led by Ho Chi Minh. He formed the National Liberation Front, also known as the Viet Cong, and began an uprising against the South. The National Liberation Front were gaining significant strength in Vietnam. To many Vietnamese, the Viet Minh were heroes. To America's leaders, Ho Chi Minh represented communism and a significant threat. For man holds in his mortal hands 
the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. And yet the same revolutionary beliefs for which our forebears fought are still at issue around the globe. The Viet Minh were able to recruit in the south, centre and north. The religious groups in the south were not able to recruit in the centre and north. The Vietnamese Nationalist Party was more northern based uh, and uh, Ngo Dinh Diem's following was largely among Vietnamese Catholics and particularly in his home base of uh, central Vietnam. Uh, and so the Viet Minh built the biggest political organisation. The Viet Minh were able to recruit the peasants, uh, whereas most of the other political groups didn't uh, show much interest. It's a communist party that there are, it's disciplined, there are lots of people, has the ability to take power from the top right down into the villages and mobilise large numbers of people. By the early 1960s, Hanoi's policy shifted further again uh, towards supporting the guerrilla war that was already developing fast in the South. Uh, meanwhile, the United States had built up its own forces. They had surpassed the Geneva limit on foreign forces in South Vietnam. The position of this administration has been carefully considered, and we have sought to make it just as clear as we know how to the government's concern. President Kennedy pledged aid to Diem. It hadn't been long since America had not been able to defeat the communists in North Korea, and they were intent on not losing to them again in Vietnam. In 1961, 400 American Green Beret special advisors are sent to train soldiers in the fight against the Viet Cong guerrillas under Ho Chi Minh. In October that year, General Maxwell Taylor reports to the president and advises Kennedy to expand the number of U.S. military advisors and to send 8,000 combat soldiers. The number of troops sent by Kennedy will eventually surpass 16,000 by 1963. It was a serious mistake for Kennedy to get involved, as he did, with American force in that part of the world, thinking that this great monolithic Soviet-style communism would rule the roost when he could have played it differently, I believe, and fought it more subtly. The great word of, of, of the, 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 the Vietnam War gave us was escalation. Because it starts off with Kennedy sending in, in just 400 military advisors who are actually special forces, uh, 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 organising and, and, and controlling the action, and then more go in, and then more go in. He should have fought it with the limited aid he gave it initially with the development of the special forces, the Green Berets as they're called, and, and other small tactical units, and not created this great a uh, surge of, of North Vietnamese resentment. South Vietnam is already under attack, sometimes by a single assassin, sometimes by a band of guerrillas, recently by full battalions. The peaceful borders of Burma, Cambodia, and India have been repeatedly violated, and the peaceful people of Laos are in danger of losing the independence they gained not so long ago. The eventual result was that uh, the United States decided that the South would lose very quickly if it didn't change policy and that the United States needed to move in with regular forces on a large scale. The Chinese, whether the communists or nationalists, were age-old enemies of the Vietnamese. It was the Soviet the threat of Soviet communism and the fact that China had fallen with Mao in a way that was assisted by the Soviets was to, to the Americans. They, they had created this monster in their imaginations and they had to go and fight it. There's something happening here but What it is ain't exactly clear In the final analysis, it's their war. They're the ones who have to win it or lose it. We can help them, we can give them equipment, we can send our men out there as advisors, but they have to win it, the people of Vietnam, against the communists. So all we can do is help, and we're making it very clear. But I don't agree with those who say we should withdraw. That'd be a great mistake. Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going on.
President Kennedy was conflicted about Vietnam. He realized that he couldn't give up the territory, but faced a crisis by July. Despite increased U.S. support, the South Vietnamese military was not making any ground against the Viet Cong forces. The regime of South Vietnam's president, Ngo Dinh Diem, comes to an end in a wave of violence. A few days before the army revolt, these last pictures showed a man who seemed to have no premonition of the horrible death he was to meet. The situation in Saigon was intensifying as the Viet Cong fought against Diem, ultimately leading to his death. Water fire concentrates on tanks and armored carriers blocking the way to the palace. For two and a half hours, the palace comes under heavy bombardment before the white flag is raised. Meanwhile, Diem and his brother, Ngo Dinh Nhu, had fled the palace in disguise. They were later captured, only to die in an armored car that was taking them to prison. Three weeks later in the U.S., the nation was to be shocked by the tragic assassination of President Kennedy on November 22, 1963. At 1.25, the motorcade moves into the downtown area. Death is six minutes away. In a warehouse, a sniper with a rifle poised waits. The cheers of the crowd almost muffle the three shots. The assassin's aim is deadly. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. Vice President Lyndon Johnson <clears throat> has left the hospital in uh, Dallas, but we do not know uh, to where he has proceeded. Uh, presumably, he will be taking the oath of office shortly and become uh, the 36th president of the United States. Lyndon Johnson was thrust into the presidency after the assassination. The country was in disarray. The worsening situation in Vietnam had been Kennedy's most pressing problem and Johnson inherited America's commitment to Vietnam and to defeating communism. President Johnson, for all his great virtues, wasn't very strong on foreign policy. Uh, he was, had been in the Navy during the Pacific War, and he believed, one, that overwhelming force worked militarily, and number two, he was a great Texan wheeler dealer. He figured if he waved the big stick, he could negotiate with Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh didn't want to negotiate with anyone. He knew eventually he would win. They could control how many people they were losing. And all they were doing was keeping their casualties down to below their birth rate. In August 1964, an incident off the Gulf of Tonkin triggered a reaction from President Johnson. The determination of all Americans to carry out our full commitment to the people and to the government of South Vietnam will be redoubled by this outrage. Ultimately, this reaction would lead to the beginning of a war in Vietnam, a war that still resonates. The justification remains a question to this day. Lyndon Johnson became the 36th president of the United States after the assassination of John F. Kennedy in November 1963. He inherited an economic crisis in America that saw him proclaim a war on poverty. He had inherited another conflict, a war on communism and America's commitment to Vietnam. The increased strength of the Viet Cong and the rise of communism demanded more resources from Johnson. But until now, he had resisted the need to escalate the situation. However, in August 1964, President Johnson decided to act after events at the Gulf of Tonkin. Destroyers of the United States Navy are assigned routine patrols from time to time. Sunday, August the 2nd, 1964, the destroyer Maddox was on such a patrol. Shortly after noon, the calm of the day is broken as general quarters sound. When the Gulf of Tonkin, inverted commas, instant comes along, and uh, there's a, 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 a spurious report that, that uh, American uh, warships have been attacked by, by Vietnamese uh, patrol boats, they use as an excuse. The Gulf of Tonkin incident illustrates this capability for instant retaliation against unprovoked attack. The USS Maddox's captain sent a report that three North Vietnamese torpedo boats supposedly fired on them. 
but then sent a retraction that it had been foul weather and not an attack. However, President Johnson ignored the retraction and ordered the bombing of torpedo boat bases and an oil depot. President Lyndon Johnson obtained a almost unanimous approval from the US Congress to uh, escalate the war in Vietnam and bombing aircraft was sent north. He knew everyone on Capitol Hill, he could get anything through that he wanted. They gave him this Gulf of Tonkin resolution, which he said it was like grandmother's nightshirt, it covered everything. And it just gave him um, carte blanche to, 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 to fight how he wished. It is my duty to the American people to report that renewed hostile actions against United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. Eastern world, it is exploding, violence flaring, bullets loading. You're old enough to kill, but not for voting. You don't believe in war, but what's that gun you're toting? And even the Jordan River has bodies floating, but you tell me over and over and over again, my friend. I you don't believe we're on the eve of destruction. But repeated acts of violence against the armed forces of the United States must be met. Not only with alert defense, but with positive reply. That reply is being given as I speak to you tonight. My friend, I don't believe we're on the eve of destruction. Full-scale military action on Vietnam had begun. The Viet Cong retaliate with a bombing onslaught on a U.S. airbase. One of the major impacts of the United States build-up of ground troops in South Vietnam was that the communist guerrillas in the South started recruiting uh, at an increased level themselves. And in fact, from 1964 to 1965, the communist guerrillas quadrupled their recruitment. Meanwhile, the United States was building up and its forces at an even faster rate uh, to hundreds of thousands. The American commitment on the ground in South Vietnam rises from 12,000 to 200,000. And suddenly, everyone in America is, is, is affected. Despite a campaign for de-escalation of US involvement, Johnson's attack on Vietnam is greeted with much support in the USA, and his popularity rises. He wins a landslide victory to be US president. Within a year, he had given the command for Operation Rolling Thunder to begin. And it's been the ruin of many a war. In God, I knew I won. Forces on both sides built up with the contribution made from North Vietnam of regular troops coming into the fighting as well. Uh, and the destruction that was being conducted and carried out in the villages of South Vietnam, particularly the populated areas where the impact was greatest, but also in the forested areas. The level of destruction uh, escalated enormously from the mid-60s onwards and had an enormous impact on the Vietnamese people's livelihood, on the way people tried to survive in the cities, fleeing from the countryside where the war was strongest into, into the cities. Uh, the cities began to fill up with uh, rural refugees. Uh, protest movements developed in the cities. The continuous arrival of US troops and a large buildup of the South Vietnamese army meant that America could inflict large casualties, not just on the northern Vietnamese regulars who had moved south, but also on the guerrillas and the South Vietnamese communist regular troops as well. Large-scale rioting in Saigon continues. We have made a national pledge to help South Vietnam defend its independence. 
and I intend to keep that promise. America could not politically invade the, the, the North because they had declared war. This, this was a police action so that they couldn't invade the North, but they did feel that they were able to bomb it. This was called Operation Rolling Thunder, and they just tried to pulverize all the industry, all the supply lines, everything in the North. And in a month, they would drop as much ordnance from North Vietnam as it had been dropped in the whole of World War II. This bombardment of air raids would last three years together with the deployment of Agent Orange. This was just the start of a war that would rage for many years. A war that would affect Vietnam and America for decades to come. Vietnam, Vietnam, Vietnam. 